Yeah, I've been uh, hanging around with the great Dale Watson for uh, about a week now or more. Ten days, and uh, I'm tired. <laughs> and I'm also waking up in the morning thinking, damn, I sure, do, I sure would like a Lone Star beer right about now. I don't know, I don't know. Well, and you know what else it whitens? Your hair. I don't know if you heard that or not. And I, I don't know what they're giving him, Lone Star, but man, it's not enough. They need... tell you what, it's pretty manly of Dale to come out here and play an acoustic guitar because he's normally one of the hottest Telecaster pickers in Texas. In fact, we uh, we had a night off and Dale went, they asked Dale to come do a little surprise gig at this honky-tonk in, of all places, Brooklyn, New York. And so uh, I, I went out there and saw him and I'm really glad I did because then there was a guitar player there this young guy that was just incredibly talented, ripping Fender Telecaster hot country guitar licks, like uh, just really awesome. And and I n I noticed, you know, Dale will surprise you. All of a sudden, Dale was right there with him, man, playing just as good as that kid. So, yeah. But uh, acoustic works. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm going to do one right now that really it's better with electric, and I'm, I'm gonna ma I may do a Chet Atkins thing up here too. But but there one one, well, one one of the funny stupid stories is one time we played a gig and I was out there talking to people and a cowboy came up and he was a really nice guy, you know, and then but you know he had on his you know Wranglers and a start shirt and a hat and everything and he said, uh, "You ever play acoustic guitar?" And I. I didn't really mean this, and I don't, I didn't know really, but I, I looked at him and said, I don't play no girl guitar. <laughs> and it, did, and it, it had the effect, it jammed his frequency like that. <laughs> and I, 
don't really mean that, but I just... Well, it's not that good a story either. Well, you, uh, Alex, how long should my stories be? 35 seconds? Wow, I'm on, I'm on a timer? Like in golf, when they, they, they put the pro, oh, he's on the clock now, he's playing too slow. Well, listen, that's going to be hard, because when I, got, when I heard I was going to do this, you know, every party we leave, my wife tells me, man, you are really long-winded. I, I call it interesting. And, All right, here's a cover song, a jazz standard from the late 30s, most associated with a TV show called uh, Mickey, it was Mick the Mickey's Flame. It's been recorded by a lot of great, great artists. I'm gonna try to pull it off and make it interesting. It's called Harlem Nocturne. about this because there was a uh, me and Jimbo we shared a one bedroom apartment because we were never we didn't even need a, an apartment really a lot of times Jimbo would just get a hotel room we were on tour so much we we're playing 275 days a year so he would just go get a hotel room when we got back to Dallas but uh, we had a place and there was a guy a really nice guy upstairs from us his name was John and he was a bartender but he was an aspiring stand-up comedian and so uh, uh, he, he he played guitar too. We had a lot in common. And one day, he, you know, uh, he said, uh, you know, let's go play some. He played golf. Let's go play some golf. So we went over to Tennyson Park, and we were out there, and it was um, it was a really hot day like today. And we got out there on the ninth hole and looked ahead, and there were three groups out there playing one golf hole, <laughs> and all of them were out in the, looking for their golf balls. And so we just sat down on the bench that's out there and. Uh, 
And of course, he was just getting in. He was doing open mics and that kind of thing. It was very career uh, minded. And he asked me, he goes, so what are your career goals? <laughs> You know, so I kind of said, well, my, my, my number one goal is to play golf with Willie Nelson. <laughs> and uh, and it's, it's really interesting because eventually I actually did get to play golf with Willie Nelson. And it was a lot of fun and really interesting. I, you know, it, it, for those of you that, are, that aren't golfers, there's this thing called addressing the ball, which is where you stand on the ball. And you putt, or you hit your shot, you putt, address. Well, Willie, when he putts, he doesn't address the ball. He he sees the hole, and he gets behind there, he sees his ball, and he starts walking. Tick, tick. As he's walking by, he's looking at, he's looking at that line. Then he doesn't stop to address it. And the ball goes like this. It goes like, like a little rabbit, right in the hole. And you know, and, I, and then after a while, you're sitting there going, "God, man, Willie's just parred the last seven holes in a row." And uh, but you know, he would miss a few. And so I, 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 I said, I asked him, I said, "Willie, why don't you ever, you know, you might make more if you stopped and addressed the ball?" He goes, "No, I'd miss just as many." <laughs> but anyway, so uh, and then then the, my my upstairs neighbor, he eventually did get to be a stand-up comedian and he got on the improv circuit which is a really sweet gig and then eventually he became one of the main writers producers for the TV show King of the Hill yeah. right and, and he was also the voice he's, he's the voice of Boomhauer who's right you know right he's the guy's like oh hold on go on go on my internet you just click 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 really watch cat videos it's really but, and then the the and I haven't seen him since all that. But the but the first season of King of the Hill, there's an episode where Hank Hill plays golf with Willie Nelson. So they owe me money. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna do, get stupid again. Try to do another rock and roll song without my guys.
Mostar. Listen, I'm a very impressionable person. I'm going to get addicted to Lone Star doing these gigs with Dale. Well, no, I, I'm, I'm not drinking tequila yet. It's all right. Hey, if you go, if you want to give me, hey, it's your money, man. I don't, I don't exactly have time to go to the bar right now. All right, okay, I got, I got another story. But you know, this whole thing about the stories is like, you know, if I'm going to tell you, you know, it's all bad stuff. You know, like nobody wants to hear me say, yeah, one time I saw Willie Nelson give a bum twenty bucks. Like, it's much better. One time I saw Willie do so much drugs that, or whatever, you know. So, you know, so I don't really want to throw anybody under the bus, but I have, I do have the inside skinny, if you will, on some people that you've heard of. And, you know, I'm not going to get up here and throw Clint Black under the bus. And, and then, it, too, it turns into a whole name-dropping thing, you know. And, you know nobody likes it. And, don't, don't, never, don't name drop. De Niro told me that. No, I don't know him. But no, I, there's, a, there's a funny story about Johnny Cash that, it's, it's kind of a famous story, but you might not know this, but when they were young, uh, they, were, they were really just kids. They had records that were hits and they were on tour and everything together. But they were young kids, and so they carried around fireworks. You know, what if you know if you? It's a lot of fun if you're a kid and fireworks. And so one day they were all in a hotel room together. They were on a big package Sun Records tour, and and they were on a multi-level you know hotel. And they were on some room, and uh, Johnny Cash he grabbed two M80s. And in case you don't know what an M80 is, it's like the closest thing a firecracker can get to a bomb. <laughs> And he got them together and he started twisting the, the fuses together like he was a, some kind of munitions expert. And he had a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. He took it and everybody was like, oh, what are you doing? Put it right up to his cigarette and lit the fuses. And everybody starts cussing and yelling, and what, you know, what are you doing? And ducking for cover. And, and uh, he walked nonchalantly over to the bathroom and went in there and he flushed it down the commode. Well, in case you don't know, fuses like that, they don't go out even when they're submerged underwater. So it went down and was going through the pipe system of the hotel and kablooey like a bomb, it blew up. And it blew out the whole water system of the hotel. Some poor guy was actually sitting on the toilet and it blew, blew off the wall. And so, so uh, it was a big scene, obviously. The cops showed up and they looked at the damage and they saw the guy, they, they saw the guy's room and they figured it was him that did it. So they were, they were, they were in the process of arresting him when Johnny Cash did the right thing and went out there and said, no, I don't know what, you, oh, that's an innocent man. I don't know what he said. I did it. So he fessed up. And uh, I'm not sure, I, don't, I, I think what happened is that he did not get arrested, but he had to pay on that for 25 years. He made monthly payments or more. But anyway, so then uh, over the, where the, they, used to, they used to have a hard rock cafe over on McKinney. We had, I, got, I, did, I, opened up for, I opened up for Carl Perkins, the great Carl Perkins. And, uh, and uh, we, we, I went up to the, what the, was the green room was really nothing more than where the rich people got to have a club or something, you know. And so I went up there and there's these rich people around the bar drinking and, and I looked over there just kind of in the corner sitting by myself was Carl Perkins. And so I, you know, so I, I was, I, I was a, like a vulture over there and I went over there and I sat down and talked to him and, uh, and I heard that he was there when that, that Johnny Cash thing happened. So I asked him, I said, uh, you know, is that story true? You know, that blowing up the... He goes, oh yeah, that's true. Blew some old boy off his toilet. <laughs> well, okay, my 
must be dead. He goes, oh yeah, he paid on that thing for 25 years at least. I don't know. But Carl Perkins is a very funny person, and I think he might have been pulling my leg on this story. But, he, but then he, he proceeded to say, listen, we were, we were young kids straight off the farm. He said, we didn't know anything better. He goes, it was a, a whole different world for us. We were young, we had grown up poor. And he said, so we got in these hotel rooms and we looked around and we said, wow, look at all this space. There's a chest of drawers here and there's all this space. You know, we could use, how can we utilize this? And then he said, you know, somebody, he goes, not me. And he said, somebody got the idea Wow, with all this space, you know, we could raise chickens on tour. He said, that's how stupid we were. And they went and they got a tray of chickens, little baby chicks, and they like carted them around. And he said, it was, it was a bad scene. It was dumb. And he said, there was some, one, one, one incident was a chick got caught in the elevator and blood and all that. It was stupid. It just... And he said, well, and that, that was around the time his record blew up. I think probably it was Blue Suede Shoes, but he, he all of a sudden started getting big offers to go off and be by himself. And so he left the tour. And he said, so I left the tour. He goes, a, a few months later, I got a letter from Johnny Cash. And he said, well, the chicken thing didn't work out. <laughs> And he, he said, I thought to myself, no shit. 